Well, you know, we can, uh, we can make light and we can joke, and, and that was a good video. When I saw it, I laughed just like you did, and it's good times and all. Um, but you know what? I think that uh, that's a good illustration, really, of, of our world. We, we do. We live like that. It's, a, it's about us, and, and, and we're at the center of our universe, and, and like I've said before and say again that, you know, most of the time we spend most of our lives, uh, from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed, basically taking care of our own things. You know, we go to work to take care of our bills, and we go to work to take care of our mortgage, and we, it's all about us, really. We spend most of our time talking and dealing with our own issues. And once in a while, you know, we venture out and we help other people, and that's all fine and good, and people appreciate it, but really what it comes down to is it's, it really is, it's about me. And one thing I will say this, if the gospel, and we've been studying the gospel for a long time now, months and months, but if the gospel has done anything, it hasn't just saved us. It's definitely going to change us. We're going to be different people. When you have an encounter with the, with the living God, the, the star-breathing God, he's going to change you. And so if you're wondering whether you're a Christian or not, you should be able to look in the mirror and you should look at your life and be able to see a distinct difference between who you were and who you are now. God's gospel changes us. The, the scriptures say that, that the gospel is the power of God at work, ch- saving those who believe. It's the power. There's power in the gospel. It changes people. And so we shouldn't be, if we, and this is, on, this is, this is, uh, this is not really a sermon tonight. This is almost like a lecture, like a, like, um, I, I want to just tell you based on the scriptures that, that we are different people and we ought to be. And so if we're not this, it's not to condemn, it's, it's to convict and to tell you, listen, maybe if you hear something tonight that the scriptures say that the gospel would affect you, like he would ch- it would change you in this way. If you haven't gotten there, maybe don't condemn yourself, don't say I'm terrible, but that just, just give you something to pray about. And just say, Lord, help me with this. Because it says it in your word, this is what you want of me and I'm not quite there, so help me with that. You know, so I want to I want to do that. I want to talk about how he changes us, and that it goes from a me-centered world to others greater than me. You know, the, I've said it before. I've said it again, and I'll keep beating this on the head. Is that Christianity isn't just purely behavior modification? It's not just don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, don't lady chase, don't man chase, don't do all, don't look at porn. Like we're not supposed to do those things. I get it. But that's not why Jesus went to the cross. Jesus didn't go to the cross so you would stop watching porn. That should be an after effect. That should be a byproduct of a heart change that has gone from seeking this filth and being pleased by it to being sickened by it and going, I don't want that anymore. Now I want you, Lord. And so out of this, we don't watch that anymore. Out of this new love, we don't cuss as much anymore. Because of this love, we don't drink anymore as much anymore. We drink responsibly now, right? I mean, so it's a, it's a change. It's not just a behavior modification. See, that's the problem is that most people think that Christianity is behavior modification, that this, this, this ethereal being shows up in my life and now I'm this, this, this cosmic buzzkill and I can't have any fun anymore. I can't drink. I can't smoke. I can't lady chase. I can't do all the things that were fun that I liked and I can't do that anymore so it's no fun. He's a cosmic buzzkill in the sky and he's just waiting for you to sin so he could whip a lightning bolt at you and kill you he's not zeus that's not who our god is as a matter of fact i would venture to say that if you went up and you spoke to a a legit christ follower i'm talking someone you know just loves the lord you know what i think my wife has the same exact bible as you that's pretty cool so if you go up to a Christ follower that, that really, really loves the Lord, and I bet if you ask him or her if, if, if life sucks now that they became a Christian, that they can't have fun anymore, I, I would venture to say that they would tell you, no, 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 it's opposite. It's actually better now. You know, I was thinking about this this week as I was getting ready to come in here and talk to you all. It takes a lot of pressure off when, when you're pleased that God enters your world. It's not a cosmic buzzkill. It's not like you can't have any fun anymore. Th- think about it for a second. The, the, the one who existed before time, who said light, and there was, who said planets, and there was, who said 
stars, and there was. Like that being, he wants to tell you what's best for you. Doesn't that take a lot of prep? I have screwed up so much in my life. Am I alone? It seems like I can't do anything right. And so it seems to me logical that if the one who actually created the universe wants to actually invade my space and be willing to share with me how to live, that's awesome, right? That takes a lot of pressure off. That's not jail. That's not bondage. That's freedom. That's freedom, right? And and see, a lot of people don't feel that way. They don't feel that way. As a matter of fact, I think that if you ask a genuine Christ follower about this situation, what happens when God shows up in your life? Is 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 it a bunch of rules and regulations? Is it a bunch of thou shalts and thou shalt nots and the thou shalt nots or thou shalt not have any fun? That's not the way it is. As a matter of fact, I think that if you asked a genuine Christ follower what they thought, they would echo the words of Psalm 1611, where it says, in the presence of God is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. I, I agree. I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree that when he is in my life, when his spirit invades my space, when his word invades my eyes, when his people, and they speak to me He speaks to me through them. When they invade my world, there's fullness of joy. I like that. And if I don't like that, I need to check my relationship with God. And you might need to do that tonight. You might need to do that tonight. I would say this, that if the things I tell you that you can't agree, I would get back to, you know, remember when the coach would say, get back to the basics. Maybe it's just time to hit your knees and just talk to the Lord and say, hey, listen, Lord, I don't, I heard Moses up there talking about this kind of stuff from your word. I ain't feeling that. Listen, don't condemn. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. This this book, Romans, was written to believers that were stumbling, that were weak, but it's to believers. And if you're a believer, there's no condemnation. You're not guilty. You're innocent in his eyes, but maybe we need to work on some stuff together, you know, so you can pray. I would say that when the, when the Lord shows up, that there's fullness of joy. I would say that when you, if you look here, do me a favor, go to Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the book. Go to Psalm 119. I, I'm going to read some of this stuff. Like the Holy Spirit, he inspires these men to write this stuff, right? And so here, listen, I want you to listen up. Listen, listen, listen. When I read these words to you, This is the Holy Spirit of God invading your life right here, right now, okay? Just like he did to David. He's he's, he's gonna teach you some things. 119, listen, I just want you to mark that. This is a long read, I'm not gonna read it all, but I wanna just point out a couple of highlights. And not all of them, but look, talking about the fullness of joy, look at what David says. 119.1, joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws. Uh, Look in, um, I have a hard time seeing it. Verse 14, I have rejoiced in your laws as much as in riches. 16, I will delight in your decrees. I can't read, I'm old. Verse 35, make me walk along the path of your commands for that is where my happiness is found. 47, how I delight in your commands, how I love them, exclamation point. 52, I meditate on your age-old regulations, O Lord. They comfort me. Verse 92, if your instructions hadn't sustained me with joy, I would have died in my misery. Verse 97, oh, how I love your instructions. Verse 111, your laws are my treasure. They are my heart's delight. And we could go on and on through that psalm. When God shows up and he gives you his thou shalts and thou shalt nots, it should stir stir your heart with affection and joy for these things. They're not a cosmic buzzkill. They're actually good for you. Just think about it. I want to bring you back here for a second. Think that the creator of the universe, like we're just trying to get by with our job, working nine to five, 40 hours a week, trying to make a mortgage, and that's a big deal. The creator of the universe actually cares enough about you to give you some guidance. 
Woo! Right? That's crazy. That's crazy. So when we look at these rules, when God shows up, it's not bondage. It's, it's breaking free. It's, it's freedom. It's joy. God loves me. He cares enough about me to share with me how I should live so that when Jesus says, I came, you might have life and have it abundantly, you can get there. And you get there by doing what this precious, precious book says. And that's where the fullness of joy is found. Now, Nobody likes to be told what to do. I get it, especially in America. We don't like to be told what to do. But when someone with authority comes, like God, and speaks to you, I want you to welcome it. I I could speak to you from a place of, hey, you should welcome it, but that could feel condemning if you don't. So I just want, because I love you, I want you to just, I want to rephrase, I want to say it this way. I just want you to welcome that. When he comes to you and says, this is what you should do, I want you to welcome that. I love you guys, and I know the pains and the, the aches and the pains and the trouble that's within just this church body. I see it all the time. I get the calls, and I get the Facebooks, and all. I see it. And I don't want that for you. I want you to live the abundant life that Jesus came and lived and died and rose from the grave to give you. And, he'll, and you can only get there if you're a faithful follower of what he asks us to do. You can't just hope for the best. It doesn't work that way, you know? New Year's resolutions, I'm going to be good this year. My life's going to be good this year. No, it's not. It's going to suck just like the rest of the years. Unless you let someone else take over. How many years in a row do you need to fail before you finally go, I'm dumb and I can't do this. Somebody please help me. The creator of the universe wants to help you. Not Anthony Robbins, not Zig Ziglar. God Almighty wants to help you and guide you so you can have the abundant life. Just get it, right? So like, if you're going to play basketball and you want to learn to play hoops and and Michael Jordan shows up at your gym, I think, okay, he's qualified, right? I think maybe I could take a couple of pointers from him, wouldn't you? Anyone? No? Anyone? Okay, then maybe Larry Bird, Magic Johnson. Come on, someone. Right, so I was just saying, he is in position to, to, to give you advice on basketball. Would you agree, right? If you were going to be a painter, okay, if Picasso shows up here and says, hey, uh, Jocelyn, maybe you ought to do it this, maybe she should listen. Just maybe she should listen. Or if you're having a computer problem, which we all have because they make our lives easier, right? So if you're having a computer problem, if Bill Gates shows up, knocks at your door, and says, hey, you know, I could maybe help you with that. Possibly. I think maybe you would listen to him, right? So what I'm telling you this for is because I believe that in this, this section of Scripture here in, in Romans 14, this is penned by the Apostle Paul. And I would tell you that this man has the ability, that he, he is in position to speak into your life. This man was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write some things. He wrote 13 of the New Testament books, this man. Under the inspiration of God's Spirit, he writes 13, possibly 14, because theologians, they argue about the book of Hebrews. I don't know, and I don't care. The, The verbiage and the style seem like Paul, so it seems like it's probably 14 books, but at least 13, so we'll call it 13 and a half, right? Right? And then the book of Acts, if you ever read that, the book of Acts, it, most of it, can someone grab me a, can you grab me a water, bro? <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, oh, my Lord. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Permanently scarred. Uh, yeah, the book of Acts. Um, <laughs> That most of that book is the story of Paul. It's, it's about his conversion, and it's about his, his, his teaching and what he does and where he goes and his adventures and his journeys as the church spreads across the known world and even into Eustace today. That's kind of crazy. 2,000 years later, it's still going on, going strong. So that's cool. So most of the, that book is about Paul as well. So Paul, I think that he has the authority He has the ability and he's in position to speak life into you. And so when he tells you what to do, when he tells us under the inspiration of God, hey, this is what a Christian looks like. This is what, this is the way we should live. I would say you should heed those words. I'm just saying, you do what you want. I'm going to try my best to do that. 
by his grace, and I would hope that you'll do the same thing. So let me put on my old man glasses here. Good looking, though. Hi, Jared. <laughs> that night's young, though, buddy. Trust me, I'll come up with something. I like your purse, by the way. It looks really cute. Sparkly. <laughs> Go ahead and lie to your church family. Tell me it's candies. Thanks. <laughs> Did you get that on film? Okay. All right, you ready? We're going to read uh, Romans chapter 14 together. You ready? Y'all there? Hey, listen, if you don't have a Bible, I'm going to lie to you. You want me to lie to you? You want to assume? There's plenty of Bibles around if you don't have one in your hand, Jared. <clears throat> you can go ahead and read it. Hey, Justin, you got this memorized? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's, that's our elder right there. Give him a Bible. Who else needs a Bible? There's plenty of orange and yellow ones here. You want to read one? Anyone want one? You guys all have memorized? Anyone? There you go, brother. Oh, he just dropped God. <clears throat> oh, you're in trouble, buddy. Uh, you rock, dude. Perfect timing, too. <clears throat> Fantastic. How was one fire last night out there in the frozen tundra? Yeah? Oh! We know you didn't break a sweat. It was about 30. That's really pretty. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, let's read. All right, y'all ready? Romans chapter 14. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. <clears throat> And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. If we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord both of the living and of the dead. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. I know and am, <clears throat> and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it is wrong, then for that person it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, listen up. If another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. So then, let us aim for harmony amen, in the church and try to build each other up. Coming to the end here. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else, anything else, if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you are doing, but keep it between yourself 
and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. Amen. That's a pregnant section of Scripture. I think that if you listened and read that, you understand why the weekend is called Others Greater Than Me. This section of Scripture is filled with that truth, that we are to put others before ourselves just as Christ did, right? The, this was very convicting to me. The reason why I stress the, the, the authority and the, uh, of Paul, the Apostle Paul, and his ability and his authority, and um, he's in position to speak into your life. He, he, would you guys agree? Like, he is the grand poobah of Christianity. Like, he knows some stuff, right? God, God spoke through him. He wrote 13 books of the Bible. So Paul knows God well, would you agree? And, and, and listen, I, I, listen this, this, I, I want to be honest. I feel like I know some stuff about God, right? I, I know some stuff about God. And I would say that many of, the, of us in this room know some stuff about God, wouldn't you? I, I think so. There's some, there's some people in here, probably all of us, unless you have never opened the Bible, whatever, that most of us think we know some stuff about God. But none of us, we all pale in comparison to the Apostle Paul. I, I highly doubt that I'll ever get where he's at. You know, like knowledge and understanding of who God is. I mean, so much that he wrote the Bible. I mean, that's incredible, right? This is an amazing man of God. And, and so if, if I think I know some stuff, and, and sometimes I tell people what you should do, and we, we're all like that. When we read this section, you can kind of see yourself in it. I hope you can see yourself a little bit, if you're honest, that sometimes because we think we know some stuff, we tell other people how they should live out their Christian life. Listen, I have Facebook. I see how we all are. I see how we rip each other down. I see how we tell people, you shouldn't do this, and you shouldn't do that. How dare you do this? This is the way you should do it. That's the way our normal default position is. We tell people what they should do. And, and, and I think of all people, Paul would be in position to do just that. But listen to how he starts out this section of Scripture. He doesn't say, hey, listen, y'all, this is the way you need to do it. What his advice is to us is to accept other believers who are weak in the faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. So here's this guy with the greatest mind for the Lord and the greatest understanding, and, and he wrote 13 books of the Bible, and so if anyone could say, listen, this is the way you're supposed to do it. Don't do this. Don't. He said, hey, listen, don't fight with people about stuff, Okay? Don't fight with, as a matter of fact, he said somewhere in the scriptures that when he came, he just preached real basic stuff like Christ on the cross and him crucified. I forget everything else. The rest, read it. Make up your mind. But, but that's it. Jesus is Lord. And, and, we'll, and you guys can have a committee about the rest of the stuff, but don't rip each other down. That's not the way this is going to get done. So let me just, let me say this. Some of us know some stuff, Okay. And, and what I think this is saying here, let me just go into some, some, some finite stuff, but when he says those that are weak in the faith to accept them, I, I don't think he's saying that, that Paul or, or anyone who might know some stuff about God, that somehow your convictions are higher or better than other people. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about people that are weak in faith, right? Listen, Paul has invaded the world. Peter has invaded the world with this new thing. He's not saying that we're better, that we have higher and better convictions, that like we're more honest or more, more better than you. You gotta understand something. He, they're invading the world with something completely different. They're invading a world that no matter what country they went to, no matter what city they went to, they were running into people that had some religion. They believed in a God, many gods, they had practices. And, and across the board, everyone was like, you got to do this, you gotta, and every religion's different. 
But all of a sudden, here comes Paul, and he's saying, listen, I don't need you to have religion. What I need you to have is faith. It's not religion. Like, you don't have to, listen, folks, you don't need to do this and that to get God's approval. Okay, you need to just accept the fact that God did this to get you into his kingdom. Like, you don't have to try to prove yourself worthy. You don't have to try to earn your salvation. You don't have to try to earn your spot in heaven. Listen, it's not about what you've done to get to me. It's what I've done to get to you. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about faith. Strong faith means I believe that what Jesus did on the cross and what his spirit is doing in me now, that's what makes me good with God. Nothing I can do to get there. Now what I do afterwards in response to this work he's doing in me, awesome. But he, he, Paul is invading this space where religious people are going through this and they're going through, I gotta do this and I gotta do that. And all of a sudden he's going basically, listen, don't do any of that anymore. You don't have to do any of that anymore. You don't have to sacrifice nobody. You don't need to sacrifice anybody. You don't have to go this and do that and wear that and say this. You don't have to do that anymore. You have to just believe that the one who began a good work in you will continue to do so until the day of Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying. So that's weak faith. When I say weak faith, I don't mean that my convictions are low and my convictions are terrible. It just means that I believe that I don't have enough faith. I don't trust him enough to, to, to get me there, to be more like Christ on, on God's power. I have to try to do this and I have to try to do that to try to seek God's approval. And Paul's like, no, 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 you don't need to do that anymore. So weak faith is the opposite of strong faith. Strong faith is I believe that Christ's work on the cross and his spirit in me, that's what's getting, right. that's what's getting me right. I don't have to do anything anymore. So what he's saying here is that back in the day and even now, there are people that still think that there's certain things I have to do to clean up and get right before I can come to God. And that is, listen, I've said this in a lot of your faces, I know, but there's some folks out here I do not know, and that, that is a lie. That is a lie. If anyone tells you there's certain things you need to do to get right with God first, that's a stinking lie. You need to tell them to pound sand and go to another place. That's not true. God loves you just the way you are, and he, will, he went to the cross to save you in your sin right now. That's it. And he'll continue to work on you and make you more Christ-like and bring you into perfection on his own strength. The one who began a good work in you will continue to do so until the day of Christ Jesus. And so, now, here in this text, he uses some, some things that were very, very appropriate at the time to give an example. So you can see in the text, he does say, um, for instance, so he's giving some examples. He's not saying this is the only things that you shouldn't fight about. This is not the only thing you shouldn't condemn people about. He says, for instance, for example, here's some things. And when Paul was living back then, <clears throat> he was preaching to Jews, he was pre preaching to Gentiles, but they had all these rules, regulations, okay? And religion has that. You gotta do this and you gotta do that, right? And so he invades two very popular issues at the time predominantly in the Jewish world were these, the issue of these dietary laws. You had to eat certain things and you had to prepare them a certain way. And if you didn't, it was ceremonially, like religiously unclean. You couldn't eat that stuff. If you did, you were like, you gross. And you have cooties if you touch things. You know, it was just kind of gross. And then the, the worship, like they, they had these certain places of worship where you had to worship him there and you had to worship at this time in a certain way like, like God's only in one place. You know, like I'm not ripping on other religions, but like I know like Muslims, they like point towards Mecca, like, like their God's only in Mecca. If, the, if my God was only in Mecca, I wouldn't want to worship that God. <coughs> oh man, hold on a second here. <laughs> mm. So God is not in one space, but that was the religious belief back then. So this is, what it, this, is, this is what he goes into, this idea of food and worship. And if you don't do it the way I think you should do it, I'm going to pronounce you guilty. That's what's going on. And we have that in today's world too. There are certain uh, Christian groups and certain people that say, listen, this is the way I believe it's supposed to be. And if you don't do it this way, you're guilty. You're condemned. Do you understand the, the idea of condemn. Oh, that would trash me. Thank you, though. Thank you. 
I'll be like, all the whole time, I'll be a mess. Um, So condemning means that they're pronouncing you guilty. But yet this book is telling us about condemning other believers. But the believer is not condemned in Christ. That's what it says. So we're in no position to condemn someone because they're not practicing their Christianity the exact same way that you are. And we're not in position to do this. So he talks about food. And we're going, to talk, we're going to talk about food now. We're going to talk about food in a different way at the end. But here he says, don't eat certain foods. And, and, and you eat vegetables because you have a weaker, con- a sensitive conscience. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. Although I think if you're vegan, you're insane. But whatever. A juicy steak. I mean, come on. <laughs> Seriously. Sorry, Lord. I, I, listen, I'm, I'm a sinner and you need to, you need to pray for me. Uh, And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master, Jesus, will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. So food, we have the kosher. Like I, I can preach out of this because I grew up in a kosher home. I'm Jewish, and we couldn't eat cheeseburgers. That is sin. You couldn't eat, you ready for this one? You can't eat pepperoni pizza. Oh my, my. I feel like I'm gonna fall out right here. Right, it's crazy. Can you imagine not eating pepperoni pizza? That's sinful. You, You had to wait two and a half hours, that's not in the Bible, but you had to wait two and a half hours from the time you ate a a dairy product to the time you had a, a meat product. Yeah, it's crazy. And so here I am, I'm a kid, right? And I'm thinking, I, I, I remember this. Like, so if I eat a cheeseburger, I'm gonna go to hell? <laughs> what kind of God is this, right? It's probably why I didn't ever wanna go to temple or church. Like, I don't want that kind of a God. I eat a cheeseburger, I'm gonna rot forever? Really? It's crazy. But here's the thing, Romans 14, four, look what he says. He has the authority to speak, right? He has the authority to speak. And what does he say? 14, 14. I know and am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. Now listen, there are certain, I'm not mentioning, but there are certain, they say they're Christians, that's fine, I don't know, I'm not their judge, I don't know, but they say you can only eat chicken and you can't eat pork and you can't eat bacon and you can't, listen, Jesus Christ in Matthew 15, the reason why Paul says, I stand on this authority, because Jesus himself in Matthew 15, 11 said that it doesn't matter what goes in. It's what comes out of us that defiles you. What he's saying here is that you can eat dirt and you're not dirty. But if what comes out of you, out of the man's heart, dirt comes out of that, that's what's ugly. Not dirt. I could eat this carpet right now, but according to this script, it says, Scripture, it says that if I thank God for it, it's good. I'm not going to try, but it says that I could. You know what I'm saying? Like, so everything that we eat, it doesn't matter what it is, because I'll tell you this, that, that God, His Holy Spirit is ferociously pursuing your heart well before He ever pursues your hands, well before He ever pursues your tongue or your feet or whatever you do, He's pursuing your heart. And so no matter what you eat, if you give thanks for it, then you're glorifying and honoring God. When you say, man... This steak is amazing. Thank you for it. This tastes so good. Thank you for my taste buds. Thank you for the spices and the flavors that are in this. And I don't just go, hey, that's a good steak. I go, glory to God who made it. That's awesome. And if you're a vegan and you have that kind of a problem and you want to eat a piece of lettuce, that's fine. Thank God for it. We have a, we're going to start a class on that. But you can, you can thank God for it and you're still honoring God. I'm just joking about the vegan thing. My sister's a vegan, so hopefully she'll watch this. I just love to dig on her. We have a thing. Okay, so, so listen. Whatever it is that you eat, if you will thank God, you are honoring the one who provided it and created it, then you're honoring God, and that's what he's looking for. So when someone says, hey, you can't eat this food... Because that's not what the, the law says. You couldn't eat pork. You couldn't eat shellfish. Dude, tear, what Jesus says is you need to tear into some shrimp and thank me for it. Yeah. 
That's what he's saying. And don't, tell, and, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise because the creator of the universe said it's okay. And so when he says, I have been given authority in, in heaven and earth, when I've given, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth, you can go, yeah. He says, I can eat shrimp. I'm eating shrimp, yo. That's what I'm doing. I don't care what you think. I'm eating chicken. I'm eating pork. I'm eating bacon. I'm eating whatever. He said, he made it, and it's good. Taste and see that the Lord is good, right? So let's taste all that, all that he has made. Let's enjoy it. As a matter of fact, over in uh, Acts chapter 10, you can just drop that down. You can read it later. It's a crazy story. It's the story of Peter. And Peter, he, he preached the gospel to some Jewish folks, and then, then, then God says, hey, listen, I need you to go spread this, man. This, we're going worldwide on this thing, you know? We're going pay-per-view worldwide. And I already paid it. That was good. I just got that just now, right? That was a good one, right? And so, so, so <laughs> I already paid your bill. Hey, woo, yeah. So, so he's like, I want you to go preach this good news to the Gentiles. And so this is, this is what's happening. He's up on the roof one day, <clears throat> and he's praying. And I know that you guys all do that, so you'll relate. You get up on the roof. It was a flat roof. So he gets up on the roof, and he's praying. And all of a sudden, like, he's getting ready to go preach to the Gentiles. Now, see, the Jewish people didn't like the Gentiles. They were goyims. They didn't like them, and they were second class, and we're the Jews, and we're the God of the Hebrews, and they're my, he's my God, and I'm the, you know, I'm the man. So the chosen people. And so, what you looking for, bro? Okay. So, so, um, so he's getting ready to preach the good news to the Gentiles, right? And Jewish people don't like that, and, and he's kind of freaking out a little bit about it, and he's praying, and all of a sudden, he has this vision that this sheet comes down from heaven, right? A sheet. And in this sheet is a bunch of these animals and reptiles and stuff. Stuff that you wouldn't probably eat. Well, Dan probably would. But no, the rest of us normal people probably wouldn't eat. But, but, but the Jewish folks definitely wouldn't eat that because they had certain foods that they could not eat. Like it wasn't allowed. They had these rules, right? And so the sheet comes down and there's those animals that, you're, that Peter's not supposed to be eating. And all of a sudden, this voice, guess who, right? God says, hey, listen, kill that stuff and eat it. And, and, and he steps back. He's like, wait, 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 Lord, no, that's a mistake. Don't do that, okay? If you hear a voice from heaven, say something, just good advice, do it, okay? Do it. So the voice says, kill those things and eat them. And he's like, no, God, I can't do that because our Jewish laws forbid me to. What? I don't care if the Pope was standing next to you. I said, kill that thing and eat it. So he says, no, I can't do this. So God's like, <clears throat> let's try this again. So three times, right? So finally, so here's the thing. Here's the message in this. Two, twofold. One, he's going to preach to Gentiles, which the Jewish people thought were unclean people. They were second class. And you guys should take offense to that because you're all Gentiles, right? Most, yeah, again, nothing but love, right? And so, so, so what God's saying here is, listen, listen, just because you guys think that they're unclean and just because you guys don't think that they're the chosen people like you are, I say they are. Go tell them about the good news of Jesus. Okay, so that's step one. But in the literal sense, what is he saying in the literal sense? All those animals you said you can't eat, I say you can so stop telling people what, don't nitpick and tell everyone what they need to do on a micro level. You can't do this, you can't do that, and you can't do this. Listen, Jesus is Lord. And I said you can eat whatever you want. And so go do that. And so we can't just decide that we know best. We know some things. I've studied the scripture, and I'm telling you, you can't eat. You gotta eat chicken on Fridays. I mean, I might eat chicken on Fridays if it's fried and stuff. I might eat that. But I might, I'm not guaranteed. I, I don't know, I might not. I might eat some of that dirt I was talking about and give thanks to the Lord for it. I will. I will. So let's talk about this. Man, it's like Jumanji up there. <laughs> Y'all need to pray for my poor wife. My. And Gabe's not here. Wow. That's awesome. Hello. Uh huh. Really? 
That's awesome. <clears throat> what book is that in? <clears throat> if I ever preach anything other than this Bible, I want you to fire me. Um, let's talk about worship days. Same thing. Jewish laws, right? The traditional Sabbath. They had certain Sabbaths and new uh, moon celebrations and festivals and all those things. And they're cool. And you could do them to honor the Lord. That's, that's cool. Whatever you want to do to honor the Lord, that's good. That's good. That's good, right? Um, but there were certain days and certain places, this traditional Sabbath, if you will, that, that says on, from Friday night at sundown to Saturday night at sundown, that's when you worship God. That should already make you feel uncomfortable. Like, that's the only time we should worship God? Really? So he's not in the other days. So that's what they had, but um, this, is gonna, this might sound strange to you, and you might think that I'm crazy, but um, God gives us uh, multiple choice. Do you know, I like multiple choice. I don't like tests where you have to like, write long papers. I like somehow, some way that the answer would be provided. I could choose. I could choose. I like multiple choice. And he gives us a multiple choice when it comes to worship. If you notice um, verse 5, he says, in the same way, <clears throat> some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. So he gives us multiple choice. And so what he's saying here is that back in the day that, that God was his, his presence, that God was in the tabernacle and God was uh, above the Ark of the Covenant between the wings of the cherubim and his spirit was there and, and, and then the, the tabernacle would move and then they had the temple and then he was in there. You know, you had to go behind the Holy of Holies. And even to this day in, in, in temples, this is crazy, they have this eternal light and, and, and that signifies God's presence. Like you, can, I, I, I grew up in temple. I can vouch for this. It's true that there's a light above. They have like this, this, this they have a stage and then they have this, this, this big cabinet where the Torah is and above the Torah is this light and there's a light bulb in there now because we have electricity but back in the day they had oil and that light represented God's presence and heaven forbid it goes out. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Like, that is the deal. I, and I wondered, like, because I'm crazy and, and, and sarcastic, but I'm sitting there thinking about that today. I'm like, okay, so, like, what, like, <laughs> so it's a bulb now. So what if, so if you take the bulb out and you put it back in real quick, is that, like, what, what's the, you know, I know this is, you're gonna, I'm going to die. I'm, this is so bad to be thinking this way. But, like, what happens if, you, like, what's the process of changing the bulb? Like, is there, like, a gap of time that God says, you have 13 seconds to do this, or I'm out of here? I mean, seriously. Like, I don't know what that is, but, but God was in these certain places at these certain times, and you had to be doing it right then and there. But here, here let, me, let me open up your eyes to, to something new. And, and this stuff still goes on today. You all hear it, right? Certain day you're supposed to worship on this day, the Sabbath, the Sabbath, Sabbath. Okay, well, this is what it says. Uh, John chapter four, Jesus is speaking to this Samaritan woman. And, and the Samaritan woman was, was like a, almost, almost a Gentile, almost as bad as a Gentile, like looked down upon kind of by the Jews. And, and so what he's saying here is that, that you Samaritans, like you worship God on Mount Gerizim and, and the Jews, they, they worship God in Jerusalem. But what I'm really looking for, he says, listen, I, it doesn't matter matter about this place or that place what God my father's really looking for is that that people would worship him in spirit and in truth it's not about like a certain location at a certain time he wants you to worship in spirit and in truth and so <clears throat> let me elaborate on that 12 Romans 12 1 says that he wants us to give our our bodies our entire lives as a living sacrifice unto God that that's our reasonable worship okay that's the way he wants us to worship and he says it's not a matter of a temple anymore or a tabernacle we don't have to look towards towards Mecca or look towards Jerusalem that he's somewhere he's everywhere the reason why he's everywhere is 1 Corinthians 6 19 says that we our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit so what he's really saying is that it's it's not about a, that God's not trapped in this of worship in this time or space or place that we are to worship all the time everywhere we are in every single thing that's what God's looking for that's spirit and in truth that's what he wants of us. And so no one can tell you, listen, no one can tell you that you have to go to church on Saturday. No one can tell you that you have to go to church on Sunday. 
If I could, this is not, this is not Bible now, this is me, conjecture. If I could, if I could speak for the Lord, possibly, I would say he'd be more thrilled if we said, we're going to worship him every day, all the time. That's what he really wants. He doesn't want to be trapped in time. He doesn't want to be trapped in a space. He's not just chilling between the wings of the cherubim. He's chilling right now in your heart, in your chest cavity, in your thoughts, in the atmosphere right here, all over the place. That's where God is, and that's where he wants you to worship him in that way. All the time, everywhere, in everything. That's what he wants for us. No longer trapped in time. And he tells, you know, he's he's, he's passionate about this. And he tells the same thing to the people in Colossae in the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, do not let anyone condemn you for what you eat or where you worship. The reason being, he elaborates, he says, these rules of what you should eat and how and when you should worship, they're only shadows of the reality to come, which is, I'm not, this is not me making up, you can look it up. Shadows of the reality which is to come which is Jesus Christ. So we should listen to him. When his spirit tells Paul, listen, you don't need to worship just at that temple, just on Friday night, just eat this food, just eat this thing, dress this way, do this hymn, do this everything, all these particulars. No, 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 no. I want you to worship me with your whole being at every moment in every situation. That's what I want. That's what he's looking for. So he says, stop condemning people who don't do it the exact same way that you do. Stop giving them this strong disapproval or pronouncing guilt upon them for what they do. Because, like I said, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. And so if Jesus says there's no condemnation for you, it lets, okay, so you worship on Friday night and you worship on Sunday and you gather on Tuesdays and you, and you eat chicken and you eat pork and you eat shellfish, okay, and you do all these things <clears throat> and there's no condemnation. It's all good. Give me glory for it. Thank me for it. Tell me I'm great. Tell me I'm the best cook in town. That's what I'm looking for. That's what he wants. So if he says... There's no condemnation. And you are free to to express your worship freely the way I lead you. Then who are we to steal his lordship? And we do it. Listen, like I said, I I see Facebook. It's brutal. I'm not talking about just this church. I'm talking about all of us. And listen, it's not that Facebook is evil. It's that we are. It's we are evil. You put any power in the hands of a broken man or a woman, and that's what you get. And so we need to let God's spirit change us, sanctify us, let us be more like Christ. And this is what Christ is like. And he's saying, listen, this is the way I want you to be. I want you to stop telling everyone, stop micromanaging, stop telling them how they're to worship me. I'm their Lord and you're not. Stop trying to steal my Lordship. And so it's not so much about a person's choice as to who they want to be Lord of their life, but it's us trying to impose our lordship upon them, telling them what they should and shouldn't do and condemning them if they do it in a way that I don't approve. Paul elaborates on this idea in 1 Corinthians, almost to the beginning of the book. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, He's talking about this, this whole idea of stop condemning people. It's not about you to decide. There's only one Lord. And in this text here, he's saying in four times, he says in verse 3, 4, 10, and 13, stop condemning others. That Jesus, verse, uh, verse 9, he said, that's the reason why Jesus died and rose again to be Lord of both the living and the dead. So who are you to be the Lord? You're not the boss of me. Jesus is the boss of you. Do you understand? And so here, 1 Corinthians 1.13, Paul says this. Uh, some of you are following me, and some of you are following Apollos, and some of you are following Peter, and these are tremendous men of God. I get it. <clears throat> but he goes on, he says, was I crucified for you? <laughs> I mean, this is Paul. This is the guy who wrote 13 books of the Bible, right? He knows what he's talking about. He knows some stuff, right? So if anyone is in a position to have some authority, he's, it, it would be him. Or, or even Peter, right? These two guys, these are the Mac Daddy preachers, right? And he's like, did, did I, was I crucified for you? Uh, were any of you baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and Paul? Right? Listen, we, in, in the four years this church has been going, we've been blessed here. Like, it's crazy how many people we've had the pr- pleasure of baptizing. I myself have baptized like 
in the last three and a half, four years, have baptized like 160 people. It's crazy, right? But let me tell you something. No one's ever been blessed in the name of the Father, Son, and Moses. If that ever happens, run. Run from this place, right? There's only one Lord, and we are not in position to steal lordship from Jesus. Spiritual authority is, is good, and it's in place. It's in the scriptures. It's been put in place to help guide us in our lives. You know, like Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So if I'm doing as Jesus does, do as I do. And so spiritual authority has been placed, put in place for all of us. It's good to guys, and we all need it. Everyone needs shepherding. I have people in my life that speak freely into my life, and I welcome that. And I ask them to look at me, and I ask them to evaluate what I'm doing and what I'm thinking and what I'm saying. And I want them to speak openly into my life. I need that. But, and we all do, but good quality spiritual authority doesn't micromanage and lord it over you. You do this, and you do that in the name of Moses, please. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We have one Lord. We have one Lord. My notes tell me to read verses 10 through 12. I don't know why, but I'm going to go there. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Yes, each of, you, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. It's not up to us to do that. Even people that are in leadership, that is not their job to do that, to lord over you and micromanage you. They have some specific jobs in the scripture that leadership has, and this is what they're to do. Anything above and beyond what I'm about to share with you is by God's grace and their, de their decision to just go above and beyond and bless you and help you in certain things. But biblically, the Lord says this of leadership. They are to pray for you and teach you the word of God, Acts chapter 6, verse 4. They are to equip God's people to do God's work and build the church, Ephesians 4, 12. Now let me elaborate on that. How do they equip the people to do God's work and build the church? How do they do that? Well, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, do me a favor and go there. I want you to read this. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Holler when you're there. Let me get a drink here. Holler. 3, 16. God likes 3, 16s. I don't know why. He's got a thing for it. You there? You there? Oh, okay. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true <clears throat> and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. This is the thing. Listen here. You ready? God uses it, not my opinions and not my lordship and not my wisdom and not my seminary degree. God uses it, the word of God, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. And so when you read on and he says to Timothy, he says, so I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For our time is coming when people will not, no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. And so what he's telling us here is keep it simple. You don't need to, you don't need to impose your opinion and will on people. Just preach the word of God because if your job as the leader is to build the church and to equip the people to do good work, he says the way to equip people for good work is God uses the word of God to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So my job really is to get up here and present to you the word of God and let it go into your heart and stir your affections to him and stir your affection to mission 
to go out and make disciples of all nations. That's what I'm supposed to do. Not so much my opinion, not so much my hearsay, not so much my conjecture, but to preach the word of God. That's my job. If I do weddings and funerals and visit people and do, that's all just because I want to. My job is to preach the word of God to equip you for every good work. It has the power to work in you. I do not. So that's what we're supposed to do. And last but not least, we're to watch over your soul, which is found in Hebrews 13, 17. And what it's saying there is that there's false teachers that come into the church. And just to give you some um, references, you can look them up. We won't read them. 1 Timothy 6, 1 John 4, a lot in the book of Jude, um, also 2 Peter chapter 2. You see sections here where the warning is that there's false teachers that come into the church and won't preach the true word of God. And so you need to be careful. And so what the, the leaders of the church are supposed to do is to teach you the real thing and then guard over you, watch over, make sure no one comes into your life that's not teaching truth. And, and, and this good shepherd is supposed to kick them out of there. Get out of this pasture, man. You don't belong with these people. They're not yours. Be off, Satan. And you kick them out. That's what we're supposed to do, to guard over your soul. But... Now, that being said, the, the book of Romans is, is not just preached, it's not just written to, um, just to leaders. Uh, the book of Romans was, was written to all the believers, not just to the leaders of the church, it was written to all the believers. And so, the main text, the main thrust of this text, really, and this is where we're going to get to the meat of it here before we close down for the night, is the main point of this is that others are more important than you. Okay, so here, I'm, I'm leading up to this, and so the stuff we discussed is good stuff and it'll help us, but here's the main point. The main point of, of, of Romans chapter 14 is that others are greater than me. So we've been given liberty. You remember multiple choice? You can worship when you want and how you want. You can eat what you want, when you want to. So we've got multiple choice. God gives us freedom in that, right? But, so, and we're not supposed to impose that will on anyone else. That's your thing, right? But now, let, let's read on here. Let's read on. Verse 20, let's just reread this. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. So, can we eat steak? Show your hands if it's yes. Okay, what if someone walked in here and they were under the impression that Christians aren't supposed to eat meat? So until we can sit down with them and teach them truth, should you eat that meat and go, well, if they don't like it, they don't need to come in here? Because I hear that a lot on Facebook. If you don't like it, stay off my page. Listen. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe there's nothing wrong with what you are doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Listen. Listen. The words, if you don't like it, don't read my post. Please, I beg you. Let that be reserved for other churches. Don't let it be here anymore. Don't do things because you know that they're okay to do. But don't hammer someone for not doing the same thing you do. And if you say something you know you can do and it offends and hurts, there's two things that are going to happen. What you do is either going to drive people to your Savior or it's going to drive them away. <laughs> and so what this text is telling us here is that your personal preference pales in comparison to the work of Jesus on the cross and what he has done to save people. And so if we know that, I don't know, you can fill in the blank, you know what I mean? Everyone's got their thing. If we know that Jesus says, it's okay if we do this, but if it's offending someone and making them get up tight and 
man, those people are just jerks if they impose that on me and you say, well, you're stupid because you didn't do this, so don't be a, I don't want to cuss. You know, I want to cuss, but I'm trying not to. But <clears throat> so like, well, we shouldn't do stuff like that. I know that it's okay, right? But, but you guys might not. And so I don't want to cuss in front of you. But, but you know what I'm saying? But the Jesus of Massachusetts is different than the Jesus of Florida. It's different. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Listen, a couple weeks ago, I told you that, that all these chapters, like 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, they have a common thread, and it's just personal interaction. And, and he tells us, I believe it's in, in chapter 12, that there's certain things he wants you to do. He wants you to live this thing out before all people to see. So if we're sent out on a mission, people are going to be watching us. And so we have to be careful what we do. So even if you've been given the freedom to do something, the scriptures say that all things are, are okay and legal, but not all things are beneficial. You see what I'm saying? So if, 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 if someone thinks that it's wrong, like, um, I don't know, like I, I, I know I grew up in a house that was kosher. And my, my mom, she doesn't eat bacon and sausages and stuff. So it's probably not going to be the best setup for our conversation about Jesus if I'm hammering sausage in front of her. So I'm convicted right now because I do that in spite, because I like to throw my freedom in her face. And, and it's funny, but it's horrible. It's despicable, my actions. Like, I shouldn't do that. So I need to consider her more important than myself. And I know I can eat sausage, but she's not there yet. So maybe I should just refrain and order a, a cheese pizza and then maybe talk to her about it. You know what I'm saying? That would be better. So that's what we're supposed to do. Um, if, if, the, if, the, if the gospel is anything, it's the, it's the greatest singular story of, of sacrifice, of personal sacrifice so that others can flourish. And, and so Jesus, you, you got to remember this, this is, the, this is the gospel. This is the thing that's supposed to form your life. Um, Jesus, I don't know what he said, so let me come over here for conjecture. He's probably, like he was in the garden going, God, Father, I don't, can you please take this cup? Like, I really don't want that. Like, he's 100% man. He's 100% God. I got all that, although I don't even understand it, but it's true. And so the man Jesus, the flesh and blood like us, is going, listen, I, I know what it's going to feel like right now to absorb, absorb the, the full wrath of everyone's sin into my soul right now for every person who's ever lived. That's what I'm going to feel like, and I'm going to get stripped and, and whipped and beaten and stretched and killed. And on top of that, that piercing pain of all the sin of all humanity, you're, you're going you're gonna to look away from me, my daddy who I love, and you're going to look away from me. And so he knows he's about to do this. And he's like, can you please, can we do it another way? But, but his love, right? He's like, again, over here, I, I didn't do anything wrong. I never sinned. I don't deserve this. They do, but okay. My love for them demanded this, and I have to go to the cross, so I'll suffer. I don't want to, but I will. And so the gospel of grace should push the Christ followers' priorities towards others, just like Jesus, not ourselves. Should push towards others. And you see this, uh, one last scripture, Philippians 2. Philippians 2, please read it with me. Philippians 2, verses 3 through 5. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Here we go. Pardon me. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. That's huge. That's what a real Christian looks like. A real Christian thinks of others as better than themselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must, how much wiggle room is in must? Hold up the sign. Zero. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had.
Consider others more important than yourself. So if we're a gospel-centered, culture-creating community that brings beauty to the world, I would, I would tell you that that's, that's the beauty that the world needs to see. They, they need to see a church that literally lives that way, that, that considers everyone else more important than ourselves. And, and so if, 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 if this, there's a lot of things we can talk about tonight, but here's one thing that if you've run in, if, if you've had a bad run in with Christians or they say they are, I just wanna, I wanna, I wanna, um, I wanna remove the black eye from Jesus. If they weren't this, that's not a good representation of Jesus. This is the way a Christian should live. This is who we should be. And this is the gospel working on you. And it's only because you're hearing this word that he's wanting this for you. That you would become very, very aware of everyone else around you. And yourself would die and your eyes would open to them. And so first and foremost, like I said, if we're a gospel-centered community, then we need to be gospel-centered. And that means we have to have the heart and mind of Jesus. And, and the scriptures tell us that we do. And so we have the, we have the mind of Jesus. So we can think like him. We can think this as truth. And we can have the heart like Jesus that was always moved with compassion. Right? He didn't get down on these people and hammer them. He had compassion for them. Because without that spirit of God living inside of you, how would you even know to do good, right? You're a walking dead man. How would you know to do anything except to be dead? And so have compassion, and that's the way we're supposed to be. That means compassion towards others and personal sacrifice so that others could flourish. Others greater than me. Others greater than me. Lots of us live in our, out our Christianity in ways that others would see as kind of weird and awkward and I, I perhaps, perhaps even wrong sometimes. I mean, I mean, I feel that way about some people and you probably feel that way about me and you, know, you might think that what we do is wrong and it's easy to pounce on them and give them the long list of what they do wrong. Let's show them what's right instead of telling them what's wrong. See, our default is the kingdom needs to move on and you're keeping it from happening because you're doing wrong. But the transitional statement, this is the most important thing in the whole text. This is the meat of it. This is the main push. Verse 13, so let's stop condemning each other. Let's not use our default as you shouldn't do it this way because that's wrong and you're keeping the kingdom from advancing. He says, instead of that, decide instead to live in such a way that you, not them, that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. That's the transitional statement in this whole section of scripture. That's the, that's the change of heart. That's the change of perspective. Stop condemning them and telling them what they're doing wrong and you start showing them how to do right. That's the best thing to do. Let's show them what's right. Let's be faith builders. No, don't knock people down. Let's decide today Let's decide today as a family to do only those things that will help push people toward Jesus, not propel them from him. Or repel, repel. That's not propel. It's not a boat. Repel. If the Spirit of God has brought you to a place of conviction on such things, can't we all give everybody else that same liberty? If, at whatever level of faith you're at right now, who got you there? Who, who was it? Was it me? Was it her? Was it her? Who, who, got, who was it? Was your mama? It was the, the one who began a good work in you, right? He got you there. So everything you believe about him right now is, is him. He, he got you there. Can't we give people that same liberty? Don't, don't impose your will upon them. Let them do it. Jesus laid down his freedom so others could flourish. So now we can do the same thing because we're gospel-centered people. We'll sacrifice. We will suffer. We will forego so that others could flourish. That's the kind of church God wants this thing to be. 
Now, that being said, here's our last opportunity to exercise others more important than ourselves. And I believe in faith that you will respond that, that God's spirit has really been working on you right now. <clears throat> remember I told you that we have these little kids that we sponsor, Holy and Angel, you guys remember them? Do you? Their pictures are up there by the door. And, and all of you were awesome and you put your names down to sponsor. Or just very frank, we're family, I could talk honestly with you. Most of the time you guys forget. And, and that's understandable. You put, you know, we, I tell you in January and you put yourself down for August, by the time August comes you just forget. And I, I get that, it's fine. <clears throat> so let's do this. I told you that every year we're gonna try to advance in our generosity, put others before ourselves, and, and we would find another child. And every year we would add to that. So we became a very generous, loving church. And you all said, yes, let's do it. And we had our baby dedication. You said, yes, we'll teach children about God and all that. Okay, so here it is. Keeping um, that theme of, of kind of God names, right? There was, there was holy first. And then there was angel. I think we got some pictures. There's angel. Did you put up holy already? I ho that's my boy right there. I love that little guy. I have his picture on my desk. I see him more than I see y'all. I see his picture every day and I pray for him and, and he's just a cute little dude and we had uh, letters recently from them and we wrote back and I got the opportunity to write to Holy and I got to pour out to him and it was just so, I just, I wanna meet him someday. He is so cute, right? So cute. Um, and then of course we came upon Angel and she's adorable as well and um, she lives in Uganda and Holy lives in Ghana, both in Africa. And I wanted to come up with another person so I prayed and I got on the Compassion International site and the Lord led me, I believe, to this next little, and that, his name, he's so cute, his name is Heavenly. Come on, right? Ah, uh, you can do it. He lives in Bangladesh. For all of you like me who don't have any clue where Bangladesh is, if you're looking at a map, and here's India coming down, right here would be Bangladesh, right here. He lives in a village, a very small village, most houses are dirt floors, no plumbing, no medical attention, no education, no nothing. He's also in a village where there's high sexual ex, uh, exploitation, boys and girls. And so Compassion has grabbed a hold of this little kid. There's a little Christian center there, and they're trying to bring these kids into this place to give them a life to give them the medical, medical attention that they need, to give them the education that they need, to let them know about Jesus, to teach them how to brush their teeth, to eat. I mean, just all these basic things that we assume and we do, they don't have. And so $38 a month provides that for him. And we could change his world. And I don't wanna put up another list. I wanna, I, I've been believing, I've been believing all week that this family right now will step up and change Heavenly's life right now and come up with his year right now. And so what I need, I'm, I'm asking you, I know you've already given, and some of you this might be a struggle, but I know God's working in some of your hearts right now. This little boy, $38 a month, that means 12, I, need, I would like to see 12 people say yes to $38 a month, I mean $38 right now, and either make a check out Put it in an offering envelope. There's offering envelopes on that white offering box by the door. And you can put his name, Heavenly, and put your $38. If you want to do two months, three months, four months, whatever, you can do it. And so a whole year, because I'm dumb, 38 times 12 is $456. And I'd like to see Revolution Church change Heavenly's world right here, right now. And so I'm going to pass this around right now. And if you will do that, I would ask you to, and this is just so I know if we've done it or not, so I can announce it if so. If you would be willing to do that, put your name on there, and then take that money and put it in, the, in one of those boxes, but put it in an offering envelope so we know it's for heavenly. If you're going to use the computer, you can. There's a spot where there's giving, and it says comments. Write his name. Write heavenly. Or if you want to use a check, obviously write heavenly in the memo. And I'm just, I, I, I believe that we could do that. We could put other people above ourselves. Someone reminded me this week of the, of the dinners we go out to and the movies and the nice cars, and there's nothing wrong with that. But while we're doing that, there are people that live on dirt and have no sewage and no toothpaste and no food. And we could change that for one little boy right now. And I pray that you'll do that. All right? Um, if you'd like, 
we got a letter today from Angel, and she drew a little picture and stuff like that. I'd like to welcome you to, I'm going to leave it up here too. If you'd like to read that, um, please do so, and so you can know what's going on in this little girl's life. But I want to take a moment, and I want to pray with you. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for letting me speak honestly and openly to you, and, 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 I, and I pray that you receive it. I just want people to, to know and love Jesus, and, and there's a way that seems right to man, but at the end it leads to death, but there's a way that seems right to God that leads to life. And so welcome him into your life. When his, when his spirit is in your grill and he's telling you what you should and shouldn't do, receive it with joy. In the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. And I want you to receive that. I want you to live that. I really do. And I know God wants you to as well. So let, let's bow for a moment. I want to pray for these little kids. Lord, I thank you so much for introducing holy and angel and now heavenly into our lives. Lord, just... Um, we, we want to lift them up. We want them to know you. And, and we want them to experience your love. And we want them to know even right now that they are loved. Even when the world has deserted them and most of these kids have no parents, they've died of AIDS, starvation. But that they would know right now that you love them and that there's other people out there that love them and that they're not a mistake and that they're not worthless. But they are created in your image with value and worth to be like you. And I pray, Lord, that they would, all three of these children would flourish. Lord, I thank you for introducing them into our life because since you brought them into our life, it softens our hearts towards those that are in great need. And, and all of us here, even though, even the poorest of the poor in this room, we have it so good. We're blessed. We have food. We have a shower, a bed, people that hug us, mommies and daddies, children, friends, job, a car with air conditioning. Thank you for putting these little kids in our hearts so we could understand your heart. Lord, I thank you for, for the willingness of this family to step in and to sacrifice and to suffer a little and to forego, maybe, maybe even forego their dinner tonight or forego their movies next week or whatever so that others might have. We all must have the attitude of Christ. I pray that your spirit would work in us to further us on down that line to be more like him. Lord, I thank you for today's event. I thank you for the racial reconciliation that's going on here in Eustis. I pray that you'll continue to work on people and draw more and more people. Lord, I want to lift up Wayne and Lena to you. And Wayne is going in for his surgery this week, this coming week. And I know he's nervous about that. It's a big procedure. We pray a great blessing upon him that it would go well that he could come back and do what he loves, and that's to play drums for you. And we love him and enjoy watching him play, and he just loves you. I pray your blessing on him. And I pray for Lena as well. Experienced some chest pains today. They don't know what's going on with her. She's going to go in and talk to her cardiologist, but we just pray your blessing upon her as well. And there's also someone that, I, I can't remember his name, but I know Ms. Cheryl asked me to pray for him, Lord, but there's a man up north and she's not sure of his heart for you. But his kidneys are shutting down. And he looks like he may be at the end of his life. So Lord, I pray that your spirit would invade his heart right now. That you would send someone into his room. A doctor, a nurse, a visitor, a chaplain. Um, uh, someone who's there by mistake. They don't realize why they're there. Whatever leads someone to him to, sh to once again share the good news with him. And save him. I pray your comfort on his family. And I pray for Amber as she goes up to minister to him and take care of his needs. Perhaps it's her. Maybe it's her. Maybe you've chosen her, Lord, to bring the good news. Give her boldness to share that good news and give him a heart to receive it. Lord, we thank you for letting us gather here tonight. I pray that your word would not return void. Help us to be doers of your word, not just hearers. In Jesus' name, amen.